This is the Breaker.News podcast for the week of August 29th, 2021. I'm Bob Mackin, publisher of the Breaker.News and host of the Breaker.News podcast. Welcome to edition number 201. The Breaker is your source for news, opinion, and analysis about British Columbia issues, institutions, and influencers. Later, I'll tell you how you can support The Breaker. On this edition, headlines from the Pacific Rim and the Pacific Northwest. The Is It Just Me commentary. I award a virtual Nanaimo bar to a difference maker. And the big deal feature. Catching up with Vancouver City Councillor Colleen Hardwick. On establishment of a Civic Auditor General and livability and budget challenges facing Vancouver as the countdown to the fall 2022 election begins. But first, is it just me? Is it just me, or... The Trudeau Liberal election campaign is not going the way the party had hoped. The Grits assumed their snap power grab election would be a cakewalk. But here we are, before the halfway mark, and Conservative Aaron O'Toole and the NDP's Jagmeet Singh both look better prepared than the Prime Minister who decided to make this all happen. Trudeau called the unnecessary election the same day as the fall of Kabul amid the fourth wave of the pandemic and wildfires in BC's interior. His failed wedge issue over the federal public service vaccine mandate, his use of she-session and she-covery, the First Nations blockade of his campaign bus in Victoria, Twitter labeling Deputy Prime Minister Christopher Freeland's video of a doctored Aaron O'Toole interview as manipulated. The PM admitted he didn't pay attention to monetary policy. Not all of the above will stick, but some of it should, and some of it will. This election is not required by law. Trudeau admitted in May that the minority parliament was actually finding a way to operate through the pandemic. It withstood confidence votes. There is no reason for an election now except for his desire for a majority so that he is subject to less accountability. Christia Freeland is a former journalist, and she knows better than to promote a false narrative. O'Toole actually expressed support for universal Medicare, and the video was shot two months before a BC judge upheld public health care. Finally, a G7 leader admitting he doesn't pay attention to monetary policy while standing in front of the Port of Vancouver, a key national economic generator. That's astounding. It's Trudeau's job as chair of cabinet to know what is going on and to ultimately make decisions based on Canada's economy. Maybe it's time someone else take over the job. What do you think? Email bob at thebreaker.news. This is the Big Deal feature on the Breaker.News podcast. My guest this week is Vancouver City Councillor Colleen Hardwick, an independent city councillor who is in her first term. She was elected in 2018 as a member of the NPA. Before then, she was a tech entrepreneur and a film producer. Federal politics is getting all the attention these days, but at City Hall, a new hire, Auditor General Michael McDonnell. Vancouver finally has a corruption and waste watchdog. Colleen, you were the driving force behind this whole project, behind uh, what we have now in Auditor General at City of Vancouver. It's been a two-year quest. What was your thinking behind this? Well, it's funny. It was two years ago in August during the break that I did the underlying research uh, on the Auditor General practice across the country. Um, I had been concerned about the precipitous growth of the budget in the city and structural changes I had noted in the way that the city's business and financial plan were operating. And so um, I felt it was important to bring an independent oversight to staff. Currently, all of the the internal audit function reports to the, the city leadership team of management senior personnel rather than council. And uh, I think it's really important to the the residents of Vancouver, to taxpayers and and users of our facilities to know that there is an independent set of eyes on uh, the operations of the city that reports to the elected representatives. British Columbia did have for a short time a municipal auditor general, but it never really got off the ground. It never even audited Vancouver, the province's biggest city. But now uh, we've got a city auditor general in Vancouver who has uh, free reign to look uh, under whatever rock he sees fit. Well, it's interesting that in, uh, you know, Vancouver is the only major North American or Canadian city rather that that didn't have an auditor general. But in the province of Quebec, in contrast, every municipality with population over 100,000 has an auditor general. 
So my hope is actually that uh, Vancouver's leadership will have an effect on the other large municipalities within the province. So it, it is uh, setting a, a new bar locally. Sadly, the uh, Auditor General for Local Government that's been, since been disbanded was responsible for 180 municipalities, which really was uh, spreading much too thin compared to the kind of detailed work that needs to be undertaken. Now, when will the office be uh, fully up and running? Well, the first 100 days, and this is one of the things that uh, really impressed us about Mike McDonnell, was he had, he had prepared a presentation on the first 100 days and what his objectives would be. And he set out immediate priorities, intermediate priorities, tertiary priorities in the areas of human resources, uh, structural necessities, and knowledge of business. So if we, he's starting on the 7th of September, September, October, November, December, it's gonna be the end of the year, uh, realistically to get the, the building blocks in place. Uh, and I, you know, it's gonna be a challenge to find staff. There's uh, you know, a, a very challenging, I think, HR situation out there currently at the, at, during the pandemic times. So uh, I think he's got his work cut out for him, getting the office set up. And then, of course, uh, we'll be going into our budget period uh, as we come into December uh, for, uh, for 2022. So I think realistically, we're looking at a 2022 start. And I, But I know that Mike, from our conversations, is already looking for low-hanging fruit. Well, we've got some real challenges ahead of us. Um, as you know, in the 2021 budget, uh, Council approved a 5% uh, property tax increase. Uh, but had it not drawn down on reserves, that would have been a 12% increase because we, we took $57 million out of our reserves to keep the machine running, so to speak. And that money's gone now. And so the challenges are going to be very real as resource, you know, our, our revenue sources um, are not 100% back. Parking, for example, which is a lucrative area for the city, not 100% back. And there's a lot of changes, I think, that we are going to be seeing in parking on the horizon. And they've all got a price tag attached to them. So uh, it's going to be a challenge getting through this year, but I, I, you know, as you pointed out earlier, 2022 is the, is the election year. And so that the council that is elected by the end of 2022 is going to be making decisions, not only about the next year's budget, but for the four five year plan uh, ahead of it. And I would see the auditor general as having a really pivotal role in that, you know, year financial plan as much as any individual year's budget. Vancouver City Councillor Colleen Hardwick, who is our guest, referred to parking and one of the big political struggles to come is about the proposed climate emergency parking tax on parking in residential areas. Uh, well, I haven't committed the schedule to, to memory of how this is rolling out, but to me it uh, comes back to a larger problem that the city has uh, in its quest for new revenue streams. Um, I've done some exploration of how the, busy, the city's business model and financial model has changed both on the operating and capital side of the budget over the last number, well, really over the, the decade starting in, in 2009 and carrying on since then. As you know, the city has, has two components to the budget, the operating budget on the one hand and the capital budget. And operating is paid out of, of property taxes and user fees, and it's to keep the machine running of roads and sewers, schools and parks, police and fire. But on the capital side, that's where the big projects get done, whether it's, it used to be bridges or bike lanes, things that are project specific. And that has historically been funded by borrowing. When people vote, they tick a box on the back of the ballot, a plebiscite that empowers the city to borrow you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, in fact, to be able to build capital projects. But starting in 2009 and, and considerably since then, the city um, introduced developer contributions as a standardized or regularized line item in, on the budget as a revenue stream. And as a result, if you look at today's budget on the capital side, developer contributions comprise almost as much as debenture borrowing. 
And uh, this is, you know, clearly a, a, a very challenging model as, uh, you know, the city has become increasingly dependent on promoting development to extract revenue. And when that revenue stops coming in at the same level, they've got to find other revenue streams to fill those gaps in order to continue uh, to uh, roll out funding for what are characterized as council priorities. And so I think uh, when I look at the Climate Emergency Action Plan, which has beneath it about a half a billion dollars worth of price tag in, in terms of that will affect the people that live and work in our city. But it, it really, to me, speaks to a, a broken uh, business model that the city is continuing to perpetuate that adds on more and more costs for the people that live and work here, which then just, you know, adds more cost and, and ultimately hurts the affordability of the city because it's not just about housing affordability is across the board. There is an issue now where people are starting to question whether downtown Vancouver is safe anymore, whether criminals are taking over. Uh, this happens at a time when police budgets are an issue. Is there a solution to this? What, what can be done? Well, these are complex problems. I, I uh, recently read, I'm going to do a plug for uh, this book, if you can see it, by Sam Cooper, Willful Blindness that talks about the root cause of the opioid crisis and the impact of importing of, of the raw materials for, our, our, uh, for fentanyl and other opioids um, and how that ha has then gone into money laundering and through the casinos and how it's all working its way out through our economy. And so I think we have to look at the root causes, because in many cases, decisions that we have been making as policies at all levels of government are coming home to bear here in downtown Vancouver. Um, it's, it's, it's very concerning. I'm sure that the pandemic has just exacerbated the problem. Um, people are afraid. Um, and they have good reason to be afraid. You know, it's it's um, very difficult when the culture is getting to the point where um, the people that are supposed to be protecting us, namely the the police, are derided in such a way. And and I, d I just don't see how that helps anybody. Um, I'm concerned about policies that um, again were well enough intentioned but we didn't consider the unintended consequences and that's widespread um you know there's no there's no uh silver bullet on any of these problems but i think until we start uh you know looking at them with through a, a more sophisticated and careful lens instead of uh, i i feel like everybody is just afraid to do anything and that includes protect themselves. And that's playing itself through our elected officials, as well as the people that are there to protect us. So Bob, I wish I had a simple solution for you, but uh, I just think that, that uh, we have to take a long, hard look and a long, hard look in the mirror of what kind of city we want to be in if we're gonna allow these things to be perpetuated. And finally, the, the clock is ticking it's almost a year to go until the next civic election campaign starts. October 2022 is uh, the uh, election. What is the urgent need for the next year? What can be achieved uh, in the next 12 months? What do you want to do in the final year of, your, year of your term? Well, I set out to do three things. One was the Auditor General, and that is coming into place. Secondly, was to try and draw attention to the fact that we need to be representing our residents at City Hall. I see that uh, our residents are, are often treated as impediments or obstacles to what the, the, the script would say, the goals and objectives of our values-based organization. And uh, we had one small advancement in uh, making it so that if you want to speak to city council, you have to at least verify that you're a Vancouver resident or not. Not saying we don't listen to other people, but we should be putting a priority on our residents. And so um, I will be continuing to work towards uh, finding ways to uh, provide uh, more influence from the residents of the city than they currently have now.
So that's one thing that, that I'm going to be focusing on because it, to me it's existential. What are we doing? We're supposed to be representing the best interests of our residents. And I think we have to take a real long, hard look at whose interests we are uh, aspiring to uh, help. Um, and then finally, tied to that, of course, is the question of what we're doing for housing and our planning for the city in the future. Um, I am a, and have been an, always a proponent of livable city principles. And uh, I believe that the approach that we needed to be taking to our planning was, was ground up, focused on neighborhoods and their amenities, focused on complete communities as, as really defined under the livable city. But I, um, I don't see that happening. I see top-down deterministic approaches, sort of either one size fits all or, or whack-a-mole spot rezoning. So I still want to see uh, a full spectrum of housing data so that we can see what we have, what we could have under existing zoning, um, and what we need uh, for population growth looking into the next day, decade and beyond through the lens of pace of change. And uh, pace of change is something that is often forgotten, but incredibly important when you're trying to restore balance in, in a city like ours, which is so clearly out of balance. That was my guest, Vancouver City Councillor Colleen Hardwick. I, Justin P.J. Trudeau. No! Sunny ways, my friends, sunny ways. <laughs> Morning, Graphic Bridge Canyon, CBC News. There are definitely more than 25 people in this fairly tight and crowded space, and provincial law in Ontario currently limits indoor gatherings to 25 people. Are you breaking the spirit, if not the letter of the law, to hold a party event and lecture the Premier of Ontario on vaccine passports? I think Canadians are facing a really important choice right now. I think over the past uh, number of months, Canadians saw what kind of big decisions, big choices their government had to make to keep people safe. I'm not sure that was an answer to my question. So did you get special clearance to hold an event that exceeds current crowd capacity in Ontario indoors? Uh, we're going to continue to do everything we can uh, to uh, keep people safe. We will always follow public health guidance. We will follow the best recommendations of uh, the uh, public health experts advising our campaign. And the first and most fundamental thing we do is to be able to look at Canadians and say every single one of our candidates is doing the right thing. We expect all of our candidates to be vaccinated, to keep people safe. The Conservative leader wants to become Prime Minister and he can't even tell his candidates to get vaccinated. Next question. Uh, John Iverson, National Post. Mr. Trudeau, you talk about Erin O'Toole and his candidates, and we know that you've told your candidates to get vaccinated. Do you know if they all have? And if they haven't, why not? Uh, every single uh, Liberal candidate agrees fully uh, with our approach on this. We, are, uh, we have uh, ensured uh, that all our candidates uh, have been vaccinated or are getting vaccinated. I believe there's a couple who are about to get their second dose uh, now. Uh, but we take very, very seriously the responsibility we all have if we're getting out there, going door to door to keep Canadians safe. And we absolutely will do that. News podcast for Around the Rim. We look at news headlines around the Pacific Rim. In the Taiwan news, vandals of pro Hong Kong restaurant in Taipei sentenced to prison. Four defendants in the Aegis restaurant vandalism case have been sentenced to four to six months in prison. While Mo Fan pled guilty to all charges, Li Chao Xin, Li Chao Ching, and Chang admitted to every charge but assault. All four repeatedly expressed remorse throughout the proceedings and sought to settle the case through arbitration. In Kyoto News, Nissan Foods says 50 billion cup noodles have been sold worldwide. Cup noodles was created on September 18, 1971 and has grown to become a leading instant noodle product. 
Sales surpassed 40 billion units in 2016 and reached 50 billion units in May of this year. In the New Zealand Herald, Blue Wiggle Anthony Field reveals he's been miming songs for years. Chatting on Nova's Fitzy and Whippa this morning, Field, 57, explained that he's been miming the words to the Wiggles' back catalog for years. These days under the guise of Red Wiggle Simon Price's vocals. Quote, I have this low voice and people would ask me to sing in public and they'd be very disappointed. End quote. Field responded to shock from the presenters. That's Around the Rim on this edition of the Breaker.News podcast. Now it's time on the Breaker.News podcast for Cascadia Calling. We look at news headlines around the Pacific Northwest. In the Salem Statesman Journal, Portland General Electric wants to raise rates to pay wildfire resiliency, decarbonization. If PGE gets approval for the 2.9% rate increase by the Public Utilities Commission, it would raise costs for 900,000 customers it serves in northwest Oregon between Salem and Portland by about $7.44 per month starting next May. The wildfires of 2020 knocked out power to more than 200,000 PGE customers, and 421,000 customers lost power during the ice storms in February. PGE said it would use the increase in funds to pay for a new operation system and reduce carbon-based energy sources, such as coal. In the Bellingham Herald, the Canadian border opened two weeks ago. How many people are taking advantage of it? Between August 9th and 15th, there were almost 323,000 highway travellers to Canada, the Canadian Border Services Agency reported. Nearly two-thirds were for non-commercial purposes. A week earlier, August 2nd to 8th, only 210,000 total border crossings, meaning there was a 112% increase in non-commercial crossings in the first week after the border was reopened. Vaccinated Americans are allowed to cross into Canada, but the U.S. has not opened its border for non-essential purposes. The closure was extended to at least September 21st. In Czech news, crews respond to another human-caused fire in the Alberni Valley. Port Alberni has seen well over a dozen wildfires this summer. Most have been caught early. They continue to be all human caused. Some of them are suspicious, and we've even handed those files over to the RCMP for further investigation, said Chief Mike Owens of the Port Alberni Fire Department. In July, 34-year-old Christopher Peterson was arrested and charged with two counts of arson. He was released on bail one week ago and is under around-the-clock house arrest. And these headlines in the Breaker.News. BC 2030 Olympics Paralympics bid suggests another Winter Games is within reach. Surrey police threaten to sue citizens who caught Chief using a personal email account. Read the stories behind the headlines at thebreaker.news. Nanaimo Bar, brought to you by Spruce Hill Contracting. Every week we end the Breaker.News podcast on a tasty note by awarding the goodness of a virtual Nanaimo Bar to people making a difference. A virtual version of the province's favorite dessert bar goes this week to boaters of British Columbia on lakes, rivers, and the coast, especially those who are working mariners, carrying people, and carrying goods. Safe waters for all. You can nominate someone for a virtual Nanaimo Bar. Send me an email to bob at thebreaker.news. Spruce Hill Contracting. Custom homes and renovations. Find more information at sprucehill.ca. Vaccine, 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 vaccine. I'm begging of you, please don't hesitate. Vaccine, 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 vaccine. Because once you're dead, then that's a bit too late. <laughs> I know I'm trying to be funny now, but I'm dead serious about the vaccine. I think we all want to get back to normal, whatever that is, and that would be a great shot in the arm. With- that's it for the Breaker.News podcast for the week of August 29th, 2021. I'm Bob Mack, and thanks for joining me. Did you know that on August 29th in 1966, the Beatles played their last concert at San Francisco's Candlestick Park, and... In 1997, on August 29th, Netflix launched. Now you know. Send me your feedback. Send me your story ideas to bob at thebreaker.news. 
bookmark thebreaker.news, you can also find us at thebreaker.ca. Sign up for the email newsletter and get updates to your inbox. For news as it happens, follow The Breaker News on Twitter and visit thebreaker.news on Facebook. You can support The Breaker for as little as $2 a month. For more information, go to patreon.com slash thebreakernews. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash thebreakernews. Until next week.